I've been an iPhone user for pretty much my entire life, so switching to Androids wasn't exactly going to be easy. When I first got the S25 Ultra, I had one goal, and that was to try and switch to it and make this my main phone, and also try and make it as familiar as possible. But surprisingly, Samsung's actually really helped me out here. With the introduction of One UI 7 and now One UI 8, the software has never felt more familiar coming from an iPhone and switching to Samsung, and honestly, I feel right at home. Whether you like it or not, iOS really nails the basics. It's a really smooth and easy to use operating system. It's got easy to use layout, simple control center, and it's also got that magical Apple ecosystem that just works and makes this very difficult to switch from as well. So it was a challenge for me to try and remake that same experience but on Android. So after lots of research and lots of trial and error, here's what I came up with. And honestly, what I've ended up here feels even better. So let's get into it. All right, so the first thing that I did when I got the S25 Ultra is obviously moved all of my data across from my iPhone using Samsung Smart Switch. After that, what I did was I actually arranged all of my app icons in the exact same order as my iPhone, because the last thing that I want to do is pick up my new phone and be really frustrated because I can't find what I'm looking for. That's just going to make me want to switch back to iPhone. The next thing that I did was I just tried to make it as familiar as possible. So I went into Samsung settings and I enabled gesture navigation, which is really good. Navigates just like iPhone. I also enabled the notification panel and control center split screen option. So you've basically got a dedicated control center just like on iOS. And also I enabled notification cards as well, which has been a little bit of a pain point because they just don't seem to go away. Or maybe it's a good thing. Maybe it actually reminds you to text people back. But if you've got a video doorbell like I have, then notification cards that just don't go away on the lock screen is really annoying, especially if yours is really sensitive like mine. The only way to get rid of them is just to swipe them away. Once I was familiar with One UI 7, now One UI 8, I then started to customize it a little bit and make it more my own. So I started using enlarged folders on the home screen, which is a really cool feature. I honestly don't know why they didn't add that in iOS 26 on the iPhone. I was finally able to add more than four icons on the bottom row of my phone, which is so useful. And I was also able to do even larger enlarged folders. I then started dabbling in customization using Theme Park, which allowed me to customize the icons on my phone. On iOS, they have a light and dark mode version of every app on your phone. And I must say it looks super clean. I'm one of those people that schedules dark mode to come on at a certain time in the evening, and the transition is just so nice. However, I haven't found a way to do that on Samsung. The best approach that I took was I went on the Play Store and I downloaded One UI Dark Icons and I applied them using Theme Park. However, these didn't cover all of the apps that were on my phone. So what I did instead was I actually started making my own icon pack using Photoshop on my computer. Basically just customizing the One UI Dark Icons so that they fit with every single app on my phone. I'm very weird like that and I want everything to be consistent. There is only one caveat though and they don't automatically change like they do on my iPhone. I have to manually enable them in Theme Park which is a little bit annoying. But being able to make your own custom icon pack for your phone is kind of crazy. You could just never do that on iPhone. Apart from using maybe a janky widget solution, which I've never bothered with, to be honest. Now, yes, you can use Material U icons on Samsung as well. However, I don't like how it tints all the icons to just one color. Normally, if I'm just glancing at my phone and I want to open up an application, I remember the color. And if they're all the same color, it gets very confusing, which is why I like iOS's dark icon mode, because they still retain their app color, but they're also light and dark. So whatever you think of iPhones, you can't deny that they're really secure. So it's important for me to try and get something like that on Android as well. I wanted total security for stuff like banking apps and wallets, and that's where Samsung's secure folder came in. Apple may have Face ID locked apps, but Samsung has a whole secure folder. Samsung secure folder is pretty much like your own personal encrypted space on your phone. It's completely locked off from the rest of the phone and allows you to install apps on it and files. And it's also encrypted and you can unlock it with a pin, password or fingerprint. And it's definitely great for added peace of mind knowing that all my secure apps are in an encrypted folder. However, don't get me wrong, it is a bit of a pain if you want to get up a certain bank app 
you have to literally scan your fingerprint twice. Sometimes you've got to enter the password as well if your phone's restarted. So it's not ideal, but I definitely have a lot of confidence in it. Apple also has this service called iCloud Private Relay, which is basically like Apple's version of a VPN, but not really. Now I haven't been able to find something like that on Android that I could use, but instead, this is where our sponsor Surfshark VPN comes in. Surfshark is a VPN service that encrypts all of your online data and helps hide your IP address, which means that websites, apps and services, and even your internet service provider can't see what you're doing online. A VPN has become an absolute essential for me when I'm out traveling using public Wi-Fi. I simply just flick on the VPN and I can get browsing just like I normally would. They've got servers all across the world so you can connect wherever you are, and it's really good for accessing stuff like geoblock content and bypassing website restrictions. For example, I could watch the US Netflix while I'm here in the UK, or I could even access websites like YouTube that might be blocked on public Wi-Fi or restricted in certain countries. It can also help keep you protected across multiple devices. So it works on iOS, Android, Windows, Mac, and Linux. It works across all of them. And if you're not happy for whatever reason, Surfshark also offers a 30 day money back guarantee. So you can try it completely risk free. If you're ready to take back control of your online privacy and security, then I definitely recommend checking out Surfshark VPN. If you go to the link surfshark.com slash notredan or use the code notredan you can get four extra months of Surfshark VPN. Thank you to Surfshark VPN for sponsoring this portion of the video and let's get back into it. Right next up we need to escape from the Apple ecosystem. This is the thing that keeps people coming back to iPhone and ensuring that they'll never leave. So this is how I did it. To be honest what you need to do is you just need to cross-platform every service that you use. Rather than relying on Apple services, which conveniently don't work very well on Android or Windows, or they just don't have any options at all, you definitely need to cross-platform everything you use. One of the hardest things for me was signing with Apple. I signed into so many apps with an Apple account where they generated a random iCloud email that relayed it over to my email, and also a password as well. So what I did was I had to go into Apple's password manager app and delete every single account or at least try and change the email and password to one that I control so that I can then keep that account. This was an absolute pain, a real friction point. But once I'd done it, I moved over to a cross-platform password manager called NordPass. However, there are so many more out there and I'll leave some suggestions in the description. Next up, it was photos. A lot of people use Google Photos to sync their photos between multiple devices, that seems to just work. But personally, I didn't really want to use Google Photos, so I started looking for alternatives. This is where Proton Drive came in. Proton Drive now has a photo backup feature, which allows you to back up all of your photos and videos to an encrypted cloud. I really like the Proton Suite, and it's much better than iCloud. I certainly trust it more. But there are other options out there for syncing all of your photos. And another option that I use is Synology Photos. So I actually have a Synology NAS and that actually has an app on iPhone and Android, which allows you to actually back up all of your photos and videos locally to your Synology NAS, which is exactly what I've done. And on Android, they do actually back up in the background. Whereas on iPhone, you have to actually have your phone unlocked and be on the app. And if you've got loads of photos and videos to back up, it's really annoying. I mean, especially when I was backing up photos to Proton Drive from my iPhone, I had to have the screen on and it took a good couple of hours. I'm surprised I didn't get screen burning by the end of it. Next up, I moved away from iCloud emails towards ProtonMail. Much better, much more secure, end-to-end -end encrypted. Although I don't really think that end-to-end -end encryption matters too much on emails, but it's still nice to have because there's no adverts and it doesn't track you either. I also use Proton for my calendar as well, although lots of people use Google Calendar. As for notes, I'm a massive note taker. So it was a bit of a bummer saying goodbye to Apple Notes and all the thousands of notes I had on iCloud. I wanted to move towards a secure notes application. And that's when I came across standard notes, which has been brilliant. It works across Mac, PC, Android, iOS, and Linux as well. And it's open source as well, which is really good. End-to-end -end encrypted, zero knowledge architecture. So I feel secure with all my notes on there. They sync to all my devices. And it's also got way more features than Apple Notes as well, such as a built-in spreadsheet mode and two-factor authenticator as well. 
As for everything else, I pretty much just switched over to the Google suite. So stuff like home automation, moving my contacts over and keeping them cross-platform, and also Google Pay as well, which has replaced Apple Pay for me. I'll be doing a full video on a cross-platform ecosystem very soon, so let me know in the comments if you want to see that. And also, if you're finding this video helpful, definitely subscribe because I've got lots more content planned. There's so many more new phones coming out, so many more devices and stuff that I want to test, so make sure to subscribe down below if you haven't already. Next up, it's a really sort of non-event really, but people make such a big deal about it, and that is AirDrop on Apple devices. I'm sure you guys know what AirDrop is, but it basically allows you to send files, photos, documents, whatever, in between Apple devices, and in Apple's words, it just works. However, finding something like that that's cross-platform is a little bit more difficult. If you're using your Galaxy S25 Ultra, or just any Android phone with a Windows PC, you can use QuickShare, which works pretty well. The phone and the computer do need to be on the exact same Wi-Fi network though, and sometimes they don't always recognize each other, but it's pretty much like Android and Windows' version of AirDrop. There's also the Your Phone app on Windows computers as well. This works perfectly with my S25 Ultra, not only can I share files and folders between the phones, but I can also do stuff like send and reply to text messages from my computer, and even run Android apps on my computer, which is actually running off the phone itself, which is pretty cool. And you can also share the clipboard between your Windows PC and your Android. So link to Windows or your phone app on Windows is definitely a good option. Now, if you're chasing like a true AirDrop alternative, then I'd recommend LocalSend. LocalSend is open source and it's available on every single device. You do need to make sure all of your devices are on the exact same Wi-Fi network, but once you are, they basically get assigned some silly names. Some of them are quite funny, but then you just select what photo or video or whatever, you select the device you wanna send it to, you press send, they receive it, job done. Now you do need to install an app for this, so unlike AirDrop, it doesn't just work, but it's probably one of the best alternatives that I've found. If you're using your Android phone alongside something like a MacBook, then Neardrop might be for you. Neardrop basically tricks your phone into thinking that your Mac is a PC because it's got Neardrop always running in the menu bar and you can actually see your Mac come up on the quick share menu on your Android. So from there, you can basically just treat it like a quick share device. You can ping photos, videos, files over to your Mac and it's a pretty seamless experience. Definitely try Neardrop. I'll leave it in the description down below. And the final thing that I kind of wanted was clipboard sharing between my devices. Now this was quite a difficult one. They'd either work between Android and PC or Android and Mac, but never all together. The best thing that I found was called KDE Connect. KDE Connect does clipboard sharing so well. Again, they do need to be recognized. They do need to be on the same Wi-Fi network. But if you copy and paste some text from your phone, you can paste it on your Mac and vice versa, and it works really well. There's also some other cool features in KD Connect, such as the ability to be able to ping your phone if you ever lose it. Right, now we're gonna talk about hardware. Now, obviously switching to Android, I had to give up my Apple Watch, which I had for years, which is a bit annoying. But honestly, I wasn't using the full features of my Apple Watch. I was only really using it to tell the time, get notifications, do my heart rate, and my step counter day to day. I wasn't really a hardcore Apple Watch user, so I didn't really see the point of getting a Galaxy Watch or a Pixel Watch or whatever kind of watch. I went back to basics and I got this, which is a Fossil Hybrid smartwatch. So it may look like an analog watch and to the untrained eye it does, and that's what I like about it, but it does do stuff like digital time, step counter, heart rate, and it can also show notifications as well. And the best thing about this as well is that this actually is controlled by an open source app on my Samsung phone, which is called Gadget Bridge, which is brilliant. So none of my health data ever goes to any servers or anything like that. It's all stored on device, which is brilliant. It's also got no GPS either, so it can't really track you if you're on a run or anything, but I didn't really need to do that. I'd say if you wanted a cross-platform sports watch, then Garmin is probably your best bet. And in the future, I might get a Garmin watch and see what it's like running cross-platform with all my devices. And another thing I'm gonna be doing soon is trying out the Samsung ecosystem for a week and seeing if I can get on with it. 
So let me know if you want to see that in the comments down below. Another thing is contactless payments. When I got the phone, I didn't actually have this set up. So I went out somewhere, went to go and pay and then realized I didn't have Samsung or Google Pay set up, which was quite embarrassing. So that's the choice basically, Samsung or Google Pay. Both have their advantages and disadvantages. I quite like the look of Samsung Pay, but it doesn't support all cards and banks, which is a little bit awkward. Google Pay is far more supported and you will see support for it in apps and websites as well. Whereas Samsung Pay is still trying to keep up. But personally, I use Samsung Pay. It works with all my cards and that's just what I use. Double press of this, unlock and pay, easy. Now contactless payments are not gonna be cross-platform. You're always gonna be locked into one ecosystem. However, this is also where the Garmin watch shines because Garmin watches actually have Garmin Pay built into them, some of them, not all of them. But you can actually get and add cards to your Garmin watch and that way, if you wanna pay for something, doesn't matter what phone you've got in your pocket, you simply just pay with your watch. It's super cool and I'm definitely gonna be checking that out if I ever do a video on Garmin watches. Another thing was tracking devices. I really liked my AirTag. It works super well because there's a vast network of iPhones and just general Apple devices out there. So if I ever lost my AirTag or my AirTag was attached to something or even one of my Apple devices, I'd be pretty confident that I could find it. However, Google's smart tag is starting to take shape. And just think about the vast number of Android phones out there. It might be something that I consider in the future. However, right now I'm using the Samsung smart tag and it seems to be working quite well. I quite like the look of it. So if I ever lost something with my Samsung smart tag on, I'd be pretty confident I could find it. However, a cross-platform alternative is Tile. I got a Tile tracker, but it's not the best to be honest. It requires background location access all the time on your phone and also Bluetooth as well, so it's not ideal. But it's the only cross-platform tracker that I actually found that works on iOS and Android. Again, that could be a future video comparing all the tracking tags. Let me know in the comments. So no, I didn't just clone the iPhone experience, but on Android, I made something even better for me. And that's what Android's all about. I know you can go mad with customization on Android. You can use custom launchers, skins, icon packs, whatever. But I didn't do that. I kept things useful and functional as well. And it works perfectly for me, especially the cross-platform ecosystem, just tying everything together nicely, really makes me just not really want to switch back to the iPhone. But don't get me wrong, with my cross-platform ecosystem, I could use either one of these phones for the day and still be good. All my photos will be backed up that I take throughout the day. All of my messages, everything will just sync together, which is exactly what I want. Just the freedom to choose whatever devices that I want to use. Now, yeah, it's not all perfect. There were a couple of pain points here and there switching to Androids, but I'm slowly getting used to it. And if you wanna check out my last video on the initial switch from the iPhone to the S25 Ultra after 100 days, then click on your screen right now and I'll see you there.